Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Life's Black Belts. As always, I'm your host, Eric Alders. Looking forward to bringing you another inspirational guest to the show. Hopefully, you've been enjoying our past episodes. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, uh, the audio is available everywhere podcasts are heard. And we do have a variety of our podcasts on video as well on our YouTube channel. And whether it's social media, online, anywhere, pretty much if you search for Life's Black Belts, you will be able to find us. I'm going to be recording today from my martial arts school, the Karate Dojo MMA and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Jackson, New Jersey. And I'm going to be joined today by Glenn Kirk, uh, Kirkpatrick, Jr. Uh, Glenn is a cancer survivor, which we're going to get into that story. Um, he's also a uh, former law enforcement officer as well. And professional and he has most recently written a book called overcome a story of intervention rescue and redemption uh, our cancer survivorship journey which he wrote along with his wife Debbie and I'm really looking forward to hearing a little bit about his journey I'm sure there's plenty of people that'll be able to identify with his story and hopefully you guys will enjoy today's episode so ladies and gentlemen please welcome mr. Glenn Kirkpatrick how are you sir thank you Eric and good morning Good morning. I appreciate you getting up early. I'm talking to you from the East Coast, and I know you're out in California. So uh, thanks yes. for being up bright and early for me to to accommodate the schedule. I appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. So um, if you've had a chance to listen to any of the past episodes, um, you know, obviously uh, we, we discuss what you're known for, you know, you're talking about your book and so on. And I really like to go a lot into the, to the human story and the journey of what we have to face throughout life and how that compares a little bit to a similar journey in, in martial arts. So typically what I like to do to kick things off is just to give people a little bit of a pre-framed background on who you are and, and kind of where you got your start. So I know you're in California right now. Is that uh, a spot where you've been born and raised or where did you, where did you get your start at? Where did you grow up? I'm a Californian as is my wife. I was born in Palo Alto, California Go Stanford, now Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, but yes, raised in Northern California later in life with my wife Debbie and our, uh, at the time, one son. We moved to San Diego. We've been in San Diego since December 88. Oh wow! So I've I've not, I've only been to California once in my life for two days on business, and it happened to be in San Diego, and stayed at the uh, hotel. Uh, I think it's the Hotel Del Coronado. I believe it's like an old wooden hotel there. Oh, kind of, yes, kind it's of, amazing. It's a gorgeous hotel, kind of spooky and eerie. It feels a little haunted when you're inside there. <laughs> Um, but, um, I just remember, um, the weather being gorgeous. I think San Diego is known for having perfect weather all the time. So that must be a beautiful scene to, to be around all the time. Or is that something that you dismiss? Cause it's, it's your normal day to day. Actually, every morning I look out the window and say, it's a beautiful day. And that's no matter what blue, blue sky, heat hot, or like yesterday, pouring rain. For quite some time so that helps me with my my attitude and the sunshine the beach sure my wife and I go to the coast two or three times a week plenty of places for um, breakfast out respite watch the waves so we're pretty spoiled <laughs> very good um, so in, in California, you come from a small family, large family. Why don't you give me a little bit of your background before we go uh, a little into the future? Okay. Well, there's two of us, my sister and I, younger by four years. So dad, mom, the two kids. Um, my father was a policeman in Palo Alto. My mother worked in an office. We, my sister and I made our way through school, kind of un, unremarkably. Graduated high school, wow. <laughs> and then I continued on with uh, community college, went to the police academy, began my career. So that's did it. You, in did, you, did you follow law enforcement because of your father, or what happened during your upbringing that guided you more in that direction? Because of my father, I would say I did not completely realize. That was it when I was a younger man, teenager. Uh, I believe others saw it like, well, yeah, you know, but um, 
a, a good a good impression representing the profession well and people he dealt with hard a good work ethic um i would appreciate that and, and model that so okay and so were you a a good citizen growing up oh uh, in reference I, I would, to in, in school yeah. neighborhood i mean are you the typical boy getting in trouble or are you pretty much you know following uh you know the the good boy path and doing well in school and are you involved in organizations sports activities uh, give me a little bit of that background okay never in trouble in school i was not a natural uh, student i was shy and not social so i believe that affected me because i wasn't answering a asking the questions that you know a student might really ask to learn to do better in class but I moved through and advanced through classes. Um, I was a mischievous guy, early morning paper routes with several friends in a city just south of Palo Alto. Um, picture boys, two in the morning, they finished their paper route. What are they gonna do, go, go to bed? Well, we turn, turned signs around at every corner. We let the air out of tires of cars. We were rotten. So, it was pretty mischief. Mom and dad didn't um, really know about that. Maybe one time later, I got busted. Oh, busted meaning my parents learned of it. Um, never arrested. Mm. So. So you, you, you got you know pretty much uh, nothing that stands out to you as any like major significant moments throughout your childhood that you look back on. Uh, prior to, to getting into law enforcement that you feel have helped, um, you know, shape who you are today, your mindset? Uh, is there any significant stories or events or things that you've had to deal with throughout your life growing up as a young man that stand out to you that you still reflect upon today? Well, one of them is my parents divorced when I was maybe about six. So that, that's been a thread through my entire life. I recall that even though my dad didn't keep a promise and, you know, uh, to my mom and I had left the house, that I always, he was my dad. So I always looked up to him. I, I've, I now realize, looking back, I would keep to look for the good, you know, try to grasp. So he's my father. Okay, he takes us camping. Okay, he's... Um, you know, in our in our lives with visits, we stay with him. Um, he fell short, and it affected my sister and I. Um, same time, or some of that, what stayed with me again is his uh, work ethic. I got to ride with him in the police car in Northern California, and I would be at his office for a few hours at a time. Let's say I was middle school, you know, early teens, and I saw the way he interacted with staff from the janitor all the way up to his boss. And that impressed me because he he showed respect and did not treat them any differently. Okay. That stayed with me through my career, sure. So um, did, did you know from as a young man or as a teenager that your goal was to be a police officer? Is that something that, that kind of formed and shaped in your mind as you got a little bit older and you were getting to a point of trying to decide what career path you wanted to follow? Yes, I would say it, it was being shaped throughout the years. A significant turning point was when my father saw as a, after graduating high school, that although I kept working jobs and did well, I would look for the next best job, paying benefits. I wasn't really in a career. And he, my dad, walked me around a community college in Torrance, California, in L.A. County. And they had a police academy, a reserve police academy. I kind of caught a spark. I began to believe that, you know, I could do that. I could go to school there. I could do well. I could participate in that curriculum and becoming a reserve police officer can be the foot in the door toward being hired full time. So um, I, from there I did uh, enroll, register, did excellent in the classes, graduated the reserve police academy, 
and started with the city of Manhattan Beach as a reserve policeman. So my dad helped in a big way by just walking me around the school. It, it became less intimidating, I believe, uh, higher education. Okay, so now did you did you get into it because you thought it was going to be just a good career path for you with benefits and a secure job, or did you have a a sense of wanting to uh, provide service to your community? Uh, what was the the main goal and catalyst for you aside from your father, you know, being an officer before you? What did you want to accomplish uh, individually? Um. I wanted to be that person. This isn't exactly what you asked, but all the time that I spent around my father, um, his peers, his supervisors, I grew up surrounded by law enforcement. So I wanted to be that, I wanted to hold that position without having a full understanding of what they all did. Once I began as a reserve police officer where you're actually doing the work, under the guidance of a full-time police officer patrolling the streets, I, I got to see the uh, public service part. Um, and I did enjoy that. Uh, Manhattan Beach is a small town. It used to be like three and a half square miles until they annexed some more. So picture, you literally might help old lady, an old lady cross the street. Um, be part of community events that help. Um, and also do other things, <laughs> write tickets and effect arrests. But the community feel of the small town and then realizing I was really part of that community um, to serve, um, I found very, actually the most rewarding part. Well, I think that, um, you know, we have a lot of police officers that, that we know personally or that, um, you know, I got a chance to train with at our school. And it's, a, it's definitely a job that's, um, I think people take for granted often um, for what you guys have to do on a daily basis, putting your life on the line for people. And, and often you don't get the pats in the back as often as you get the criticisms of when, you know, something goes wrong, which happens in just about every career. There's bad apples in every career. Um, but, but for you, did you, did you find the experience uh, a rewarding one? Did you, was your community supportive of, of you at that time? Because the uh, dynamic of our, our politics and society seem to be a little bit different now, uh, depending what town you're in, in reference to how they view the police community. Um, thanks for asking. Very well put. Excuse me. Sure, every, every department's a bit different or a lot different, depending on where it's located in the, in the U.S. It's leadership, support or not, the level of support for the community, uh, the population, how large the uh, the city or county is. So I worked for a small department and it was easier to have positive contact with the community who really favored us. Now, um, at the same time, we would have some inner city folks, if you will, come into Manhattan Beach, you know, middle of the night and uh, steal a car, rob a, a person, or during the day, rob a bank, or... So we began to feel, the officers began to um, experience all the type of crimes that would happen in the big city, but I put it as, it was far less frequent. A um, couple cities over, you're in LAPD, and that's rough and tough, and you know it, it would affect an officer in a way that I wasn't affected it was kinder and gentler um so overall you had a more uh, positive experience but i would still imagine you know being a police officer for a large portion of your adult life that you you come across you know parts of society that not many people um have an opportunity to see well you know whether it's from automobile accidents to domestic abuse to everything in between and I don't think people really understand the the mindset that that an officer has to deal with every day, and then somehow you know check out when they get home and just focus on their family and not take home that that stress and or, or that drama with them. Um, you know, specifically, just to give you an example of what I'm I'm trying to frame here in the question is, I remember um, when the uh, Sandy uh, school shooting took place over. I think it was in uh, 
in Connecticut or Long Island. I'm, I can't remember the state it was right now, but when the young man came in and, and shot up the, uh, I think it was the first or second grade class at the time and some teachers, my uh, twin daughters with the same age and the same grade at that time. Mm-hmm. And just as a father, I was, I was in tears because I just couldn't, can fathom something so awful. But the other thought I had right after that as a father was, you know, there's police officers and, and first responders that had to walk into that scene and see that and, and, and clean it up and take pictures and document it and write reports on it. And that's, I, I don't understand how you could do something like that as a human and not have it have an impact on you. And it must be difficult to take those types of moments and it not impact you uh, as deeply as it could uh, in the negative or to, to be brought home to your family. And I'm sure some officers do, you know, officers do struggle with that. So for, for yourself, did you have any of those moments throughout your career that, that were really uh, tough pills to swallow that, you know, most people that go about their everyday lives, you know, really never encounter? Sure. And I appreciate you mentioned that and framed it that way. Uh, now I'm thinking when I first began, to answer your other question. I was thinking of when I first began at the police department as a young man. Sure, so over time, over the years, well, a lot of things that stuck with me are the first. So the first time I saw a dead body, um, one dead body I saw in a house was actually a woman, elderly woman, who was an alcoholic, who I had arrested during the day. She was crashed her car after a hair appointment and she was, I think she had a 0. 0.40 or something, like four, almost five times the legal limit in California. And, you know, she was, she was arrested. And then a few months later, a dead body called and, you know, her son had called and that did smack me. I did my job. We moved through the shift. But gee, I saw her. Although drunk, right, she was alive and had a chance to sober up. And uh, but here, she, you know, she passed. Um, sure, a particular traffic accident where what I'd never seen is speeding in a car, single, single person accident. They they just crash right into parked cars, and the person was all folded up mm. under the dash. Um, um, so, I mean, I, listen, you don't even, I, 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 and I appreciate you giving me some of those stories. It must be difficult. I'm sure the images flash in your mind when you think back to these moments. But going more, uh, going deeper in, in, inside a little bit, how did you balance these days out? Um, at, well, let me rewind a little bit. Let me preframe that a little bit differently. Did you have um, a relationship with your wife at that time as a police officer? Did you meet her, you know, at some point in the middle of your career? So why don't you answer that that first? When did you meet your current wife and was she a part of you, uh, your life um, early on in your career or later? Earlier, in fact, I graduated from the police academy and just maybe three months into actually working the job, I met Debbie at the only 24 hour restaurant. We were engaged actually a few days later and wow. we've been together every day. So, so well, I have to pause there for a moment. And we'll get back to the other question. So you, you meet somebody a few months after, you know, graduating and a few days later you're engaged. That, that sounds obviously uh, pretty fast. I, I met my current wife in college and we got engaged on our, our, our year anniversary and people thought we were moving quickly. So you got me beat with three days. So uh, love, <laughs> it, <laughs> love at first sight or what's the story there? Cause you're still together. So obviously it worked out yeah. for you. Well, we became fast friends. We spent every day together. I, we both think it was impulsive that and we laugh about it now that I asked her and she said, yes, we did not know how to be married or what we were doing. But the spark was uh, real friendship, kindness on Debbie's part. And, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how to explain it. Um, 
like, just like something the, you knew like it, the, you, you felt yeah. it and you internalized it. you you when people say you know like you just know I, I i'm feeling from you that's what you're trying to say is that you guys just knew even though you didn't have all the answers or knew how to navigate you know being grown-ups in, in a marriage um you just knew that you had to be together and that was enough for you guys to move forward is that right yes yes sure okay so then now that she's involved uh, during your career, when you have these moments that stand out to you that are that are tough to deal with and horrific, and you know some humans wouldn't even be able to tolerate something like that, these are things you have to see, you know, year after year. Unfortunately, how did you find the way to balance out separating what you did for a career to being able to come home and still have you know the sympathy and the empathy and the love and the the, the ability to show attention to your wife and shut off your mind and your emotions of what you encountered during your work day. Talking with the other officers and sometimes on that shift, not really at length, like it was understood. This is what we went through. Wow. Glad the shift is over or, or maybe, um, wow, because it was so exhilarating with, with Debbie. Uh, I shared, I shared a lot and she could handle it. So we, I would talk about the shift. If she okay. didn't want to really know about something or detail, she'd say, but we were able to, um, to talk about, you know, the shift and, uh, my feelings. So. Okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't something that stood out to you as, as a challenge. You, you made it just, this is what I do. This is my career. And it's just a, although it's different than what most people do, you just were able to, to check out when you got home and it didn't follow you as often. Well, yes, I think what, what do I think today is that I didn't realize any accumulative effect of, of a career over time on, on me. So at the time, I recall that we would talk through things and be able to, uh, you know, move past them. Um, and that Debbie was interested and engaged. Okay. So, yeah. so let's let's go let's go forward a little bit. We talked a little bit about your career, and obviously, um, you know, one of the reasons that I have you on the show is to talk about um, your cancer survival and the effects of dealing with the treatment to this day and, and now writing a book, um, and trying to help inspire others, uh, getting through their own challenges. So, um, why don't you walk me through that a little bit? At what point in your life did, did cancer enter your world? In 1987. So I was working as a police officer in Manhattan beach. Debbie and I had been married going on seven years. We had one son that was a little over two. So that was 1987. And uh, I'm going to break it down or. Yeah, no, please. I just okay. briefly just tell me, you know, okay. obviously that, you know, that, that I wasn't sure if it happened earlier on or later in life. So it happened yeah. pretty, it pr happened pretty, um, you know, early for you as, as yeah. a new father and as a police officer. So, um, again, you, you're the one that, that is here to tell your story and you wrote the book on it. So you don't have to go in tremendous detail, but why don't you highlight a little bit, um, okay. you know, what happened, the diagnosis, how it affected you and your family. And, and then you, we can go from there. Okay. Well, I worked in an undercover capacity and what that meant is I didn't have to shave every day. So, uh, one morning I'm shaving and there's a lump as if half of a golf ball was protruding. I mean, how can, how can that be? How could I not notice it? Well, I was swollen lymph node, it turned out to be. Biopsy. Cancer was suspected. And then I had uh, the lab results. Then I had a surgery, Stanford staging laparotomy. They open you up, upper chest down to your belly button and um, biopsy different lymph nodes. So I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage 3A. Um, I mean, we, uh, we're in fear. We were devastated. It, things happen so fast from noticing the lump to here you go and you need to have, you have radiation. 
So that year I had 50 radiation treatments. And that's, I later learned that's quite a few. And uh, that was a difficult summer. In the book, we title it The Nuclear Summer. And uh, you, can, you can understand why. So um, basically, that was a difficult year, lost weight, was off work. The radiation did the trick, and I gained remission that same year. Gradually gained uh, energy. Deb and I celebrated. We went to um, Bruce Springsteen, U2, Don Henley, Building the Perfect Beast concerts to celebrate, and Cancun for a week. So a good time for us to get some respite after that difficult year. I uh, returned to work the next year and had a blast. So I thought I, I thought I might die or would die. And now here I am back in the uniform, healthy, fit. I'd lost some of the weight I needed to lose. And I was back at work. So I would say originally, I thought maybe Nothing changed, but everything had changed. So even though I was back to work. Um, and we did decide to change things up and Debbie and I moved from LA County to San Diego. We were able to buy four acres on an old horse ranch. We're not horse people, but the property was beautiful. We moved there. And about a year and a half later, the Hodgson's lymphoma returned. And that was a difficult, difficult news to get. And um, I underwent chemotherapy. And I had fear about chemotherapy, is what I'd said in my mind, which isn't true, but in my mind was, oh, chemotherapy is given to people to extend their life, but they're going to die anyway. So that's what I operated under. I grew very depressed was hospitalized and had electroconvulsive therapy, ECT. Um, it worked, it was effective, it, it woke me up. I had an awakening. I mean, literally, I was a new man, but I was the one I, before I was sick. So Debbie was so excited. So I was released from the hospital, took time to fully recover. And then I'm back at work and I'm a policeman again. <laughs> And again, I, I felt like Superman working healthy. Oh, the cancer had gone into remission. The depression fully lifted. We fast forward about a year and a half after that. I was diagnosed with chronic lymphocyte leukemia. It's also known as CLL. So again, part of me thought, what, what am I not learning? You know, it's cancer again. With our new faith and uh, family of faith, however, everything was different. Debbie and I were able to sit on the couch, cry over the um, diagnosis, bewildered that it would happen again, although a different kind of cancer, but resolved to be close and reach out. And so we had great support through that, that period of time. Um, it took five years to gain remission from the leukemia. So during that time, I was required to retire early from my once beloved career. The big blessing though, I had every day with my young sons. By then we had two sons, uh, just invaluable. Um, and you, again, five years later, I gained remission. So that's in a nutshell. <laughs> So th three different times of getting cancer and beating it. And was the third one the final, the final time? Uh, thanks for asking. I've been in remission uh, from both types of cancer. I've been in remission from the last one since 1996. 1996. That's fantastic. It must have been some some tough moments, especially with young children at home and and and, and a wife that you love. Um, you know, feeling the the joy of beating the disease that takes so many people down, but then keep getting knocked down over and over and over again. Um, was it just uh, your faith and love uh, for one another and family that gave you the strength that like were 
I would imagine there are moments of, you know, maybe they weren't of moments of feeling like giving up or not, you know, what was going through your mind? I'm sure you, you talked about depression lifting. So I imagine there were, there were obviously some, some dark moments through that experience for you. Sure. During 1989 and the second diagnosis and over the course of that year, eight months of chemo, I'd never been de depressed before, but I grew, I grew very depressed. Um, Suicidal thoughts, unruly thoughts. Uh, turned out that I had drug-resistant de depression, so none of the medications worked. Debbie's great in concert with others. We're just talking to every doctor about what do we do, and that's when three psychiatrists recommended electroconvulsive therapy. I wasn't myself, as you'd imagine. I was in bad shape, so I complied. It's not like I made a decision not like I compared all the facts, did research. Um, I just went along with the program and went into the hospital. And thank God I did, because again, it lifted the depression. So right, that's the lowest point of this overall journey. And it was significant. Um, yeah, moving forward, after I regained, regained my health, was no longer depressed. And Debbie and I each turned to Christ, I like to say that everything was different. We had already been close. Well, we were now, Debbie and I, battle-tested, and our faith and friends helped us through. I don't want to make it sound Pollyannic. Uh, I'd had plenty of times where I felt alone in it. You know, I alone had that experience, and Debbie alone had her experience and together we had it. Uh, others we could tell about it, but if they hadn't. Yeah, it's hard to explain to people when you're the one that's going through it, which is why you feel alone sometimes because you're the one experiencing no matter how good their intentions are as a good friend to be there and support you. Uh, at the end of the day, you still realize that you're the one that's that's feeling what you're feeling, going through the therapies, and you know dealing with the pain, and I'm sure a lot of the side effects that come along with that. Um, at what point after that third time of beating it, beating it, and being out of remission for for so long, did you decide that you had to share your story with other people and and write your book? So why don't you talk about that for a moment? Okay, thank you. In the early 2000s. It came to me as an idea. I'm somewhat of a researcher, so I thought, if I'm going to write a book, how does one begin and to make it professional and excellent? So my route was, I researched on, um, I write a, like a three chapter book proposal. I did, I pitched that to literary agents, publishers. I got some great feedback. No one was interested in the project, but some of the great feedback was keep writing. Three chapters is not a book. So, uh, but that's helpful. All that was helpful. Well, at the same time, uh, married, career, and kids. And I did, I was able to work, but I still had fatigue as I realized um, I, I need to live longer and have more experiences to actually write a full book. So I just parked it, I left it on my desktop. About 2000. 11, I was inspired again to, to write. A good friend inspired me to write who knew my story and said it was inspirational. So I began to write some every day and it, it began to be, it began to take form. It became a complete book in uh, March of this year, uh, we, we published Overcome. A traditional publisher picked it up and we were excited about that. So, so what's it, I would imagine as with anyone, um, has been touched by cancer either personally themselves or they have friends or family members and, and I am no different as well. I've lost multiple grandparents, uh, to cancer and, and friends and, and, and family as well, um, all over. So it's a, a horrible disease and, um, I hope they overcome it one day, but there's a lot of people that are out there that are either at the beginning of their story the middle of it or maybe at the end like yours but still battling some of those past demons so I imagine through your book your goal is to try to help you know comfort people and give them some support and guidance from your personal experience so for anyone that may be listening 
that's experiencing this themselves or with a family member, what, what type of advice uh, do you like to give out or uh, the, the questions that keep coming up to you as you're traveling around and discussing your book? Um, there may be some questions that are, that are repetitive um, that may be related to going through yourself. So if you had a moment to pass on some feedback or advice to individuals or family members that are dealing with cancer in their family, what would you say to them? Pursue whatever you need. As, as you uh, discussed and just posed the question, Eric, this is what I'm thinking. So one person who's diagnosed with cancer, they may need to go away for a week or two. I mean, if that's something they could do uh, alone with a friend, regroup. Someone else may, it helps them to do much research on the cancer, on the treatment. Someone else may um, begin to do some creative things or get back to uh, you know, their art or writing as they move through their doctor appointments and their um, any treatments or uh, procedures. So in, in short, pursue what you need. Tell us close to you what that is and, and reach out. Um, even when you have to, because I've had to overcome the feeling that, oh, I don't want to bother them or I shouldn't need that or whatever those thoughts that can challenge one. So what about when people are feeling that the diagnosis in itself is a death sentence? Cause you're the, the proof that it doesn't always have to be that way. How do you, how do you try to help someone when they psychologically are going through that point where they think they're, they're at the, the end of the rope and you know, why continue the fight? Well, I would say, unless you're told that by the specialists, that's not the case. Even if you're told that by the specialists, um, just my opinion, you have six months to a year to live, I get the second and third opinion, and nothing against that first person who could have been oncologist, who could be spot on, that there's always hope. I think how ever long we live, live with hope. So six months, you get 60 years. Um, that, so although, although any one person in their life could not take the fear away, if the person with cancer who believes, oh, this is a death sentence, because I thought that, again, open, reach out, get your needs met. Maybe it's that a close friend will do the research for you because you can't bring yourself to check it out. So, um, oh, that it's understandable feeling. I would never tell somebody don't feel guilty because, you know, I found it doesn't help to tell somebody how to feel. But in personal sharing saying, I once thought that. My wife thought that. We thought that twice. And then you regroup and you think, okay, what's, what are the facts? What can we do? The team that's helping us through this journey you know, what are they doing? And then I would have much to say about that, I'm realizing. So, well, striving to find joy in each day, which is, can be hard to find when you're in the midst of that battle. And uh, what I do think I, I learned first before finding joy was actually the significance of living in the moment. Because with a diagnosis, everything can slow down. It seemed like that to me, where just <laughs> life life is slow, and you, you wake up thinking about the disease, you go to bed thinking about the disease. Yeah. I would imagine that uh, whether yourself or others that you encounter with similar experiences, that when they know they're about to start radiation or chemotherapy, that the unknown of how their body's going to react to it um, probably gets some some you know obvious normal fears inside their brain a little bit of, you know, what kind of pain am I going to be in? Am I going to lose my hair? How is this going to affect my, my daily life? Um, through your experiences of going through this three, three separate times and overcoming it, when someone's about to enter that spot of starting their treatment and they don't know if they're strong enough, uh, and if you had a moment to, to be in that room with them and hold their hand and say something to them, being able to look back yourself, knowing that you got through it and probably had the same thoughts they're having, is there any words of encouragement that you'd be able to give them to let them know that they that they are strong enough to, to face this? 
I would hope to be a great listener so as they not only felt listened to, but I could hear the fears, the insecurities. I would seek to identify with them and tell them that because I was there, let's, let's share this burden together. Let's kind of spread it out, maybe make it less ominous. And right. I wouldn't, can't, and well, not candy coating it. If they said, I'm going to lose my hair. Yeah, you, you most probably will. I did. Oh. But, you have a, but you have a killer mustache, so you made up for it. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. I'm talking from someone who also has quite the hairdo as, as, as well, so I could relate. <laughs> um, so um, I would imagine that a lot of these thoughts and stories would be would be found inside your book, and, and would the best place to find that be at Amazon or a local bookstore, or where would you point people if they wanted to um, learn a little bit more about you by, by uh, supporting you and getting a copy of your book? I would consider Amazon the universal way because – Anybody in the world go online, can order it. Uh, additionally, Barnes and Noble online. And then we have a, a local bookstore in San Clemente, California. But Sure. Uh, and have you been getting good feedback since releasing the book from people that uh, have read it? Have you had a chance to meet anyone that's read it and shared their, their thoughts and their stories about it? Yes. And so folks who bought the book, read the book, we're good enough to do a Amazon review and many of those same people we also met in person. And that's great because then I can ask a follow-up question. You know, awesome, your book, we like this, very relatable. And then, okay, but, and then I ask some more questions. So um, excellent feedback. Um, and we're, we're new at this. And of course we don't hear Feedback from everyone who buys a book. If sales have been, you know, across the U.S. Um, well, I'm sure it must be uh, empowering for you to look back and remember those moments when things were a little bit darker and uh, it kept coming back over and over. And you probably had some some sleepless nights, wondering if you'd make it through. And um, being on the flip side of it now, looking back and knowing that you could use your experience to help help others, that's, uh, it's very noble because some people go through what you do and the mere fact of survival is enough for them. Uh, not many people take it to the next level and try to serve their community, but it may be a part of, of your life and your upbringing as a police officer and a public servant your whole life to, to still feel that need somehow to support your community and give back. So um, I, think it's, I think it's awesome that you took a step further and uh, allowed yourself to be vulnerable and, and, and share some intimate details about your life and your struggles and in your story. If people wanted to learn a little bit more about you and aside from the book and they wanted to maybe find you online, is there a website and or some social media that you could uh, point us to? I will include this as well in the, in the show notes afterwards. So people okay. can look at the show notes and, and click on the links and make it quite convenient. But well, you know, while people are listening or watching, what would, um, what would be some good directions to point them in? Thank you. So our website all, all one word is overcomingdaily.com. So that's our website. Chapter one, the entire chapter one of the book is listed there. Um, it's something someone can look at and read. Additionally, there's a media page uh, regarding our, our speaking. There's a video. We did about a 14-minute talk. Excuse me. And additionally, um, there's some other information. You can buy the book right from there. Oh, the contact, because we encourage folks to, whether they've read the book or not, to contact us. And there's a contact page. They can shoot us an email. We would love to hear from anyone. So that's a pretty straightforward way to reach us. Good. So would your website also be able to point them to any social media links if they wanted to follow you on, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or things along, uh, along those lines? Are you on those uh, different services? Okay, good point. Yes. Yeah, so Facebook, our author page is Glenn and Debbie Kirkpatrick. Deb and I each have one on our own, our own name. Um, Instagram, we're on Twitter, and LinkedIn. So 
Cool. So plenty of ways to to follow what you're doing in your daily life, but also to be able to reach out to you and possibly share a story and 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 have a um, an ally that's that's gone through it. And I think whether it's martial arts, business, uh, or in this case something that's medical, trying to surround yourself by people that have already done it. Uh, as a mentor, if you will, is is probably one of the best decisions that you can make. Instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and think that you're the only one in the world that's ever gone through it, try to find someone that's been there and done that and can help guide you a little bit. And that's hopefully when we make it further in life and get some of this life experience and wisdom. Uh, I think one of our duties and responsibilities is try to, to help others and pass that on uh, and, and help maybe make their path and their journey a little bit easier. And hopefully each generation um, we do our best to to let the next generation um, avoid as many of our, our mistakes as possible or learn from our, our positive decisions as well. So, um, you know, thank you for doing what you did. And I look forward to to looking at the book and, and, and following you online and learning more about your story. And I'm, I'm sure it's difficult to, to bring up, but um, as a survivor, uh, I think it's, it's, it's awesome to see someone that's battled through it three different times and overcome it. And, uh, I'm sure that this is just a beginning for you. So continue to get out there and, 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 and promote your book and get some public speaking events out there. And I hope anyone that listens to the show reaches out to you and, and shares their feedback and their stories with you as well. I know there's plenty of people that you'll be able to help with your uh, experiences. So, um, is there any last bits of information, um, quotes that you like, uh, advice, anything along the lines that you'd want to, to leave someone with that, that helps you get through your day or something that helps to empower you and keep you motivated to do what you do each day? Anything along those lines that you'd like to pass on? There's so much, but if I picked one brief thing, Primo Levi is a whole Holocaust survivor. The sea's only gifts are harsh blows and occasionally the chance to feel strong. Now, I don't know about the sea, much about the sea, but I do know that that's the way it is here. And I also know how important it is in life, not necessarily to be strong, but to feel strong. To measure yourself at least once, to find yourself at least once in the most ancient of human conditions. Facing blind, deaf, stone alone, with nothing to help you but your hands and your own head. And I would point out especially, and I also know how important it is in life, not necessarily to be strong. I'm not necessarily strong uh, physically, but to feel strong and then to measure yourself against an obstacle adversity. Uh, that's in the book. I placed a quote in the front of the book. It inspires me. So I love that. And I love that. And then, uh, you know, you had to find that inspiration to get through what you had to do. So you're sharing that with, with, with others on what was significant and helping you get through and, and still keeps you motivated. And um, it's interesting, you know, how this whole circle works that people could read your book and without you knowing it might find some lines that you've written and some statements that you've made that, that might be at the front of their book one day, or at least in, at least in their mind to help them through each day. And, and had you not taken the step forward to, to share your story, that may never happen. So, um, you know, good job doing what you've done and sharing your story. And, and most of all, congratulations on, on, on kicking this disease's butt and surviving as long as you have and being there for your children and your grandchildren and your wife. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a beautiful story of, of how you guys met and have kept that love and, and, and partnership so strong. So anyone that thought you guys were crazy getting engaged after three days uh, <laughs> did not know uh, the path that was going to lead you guys on. And obviously it happened for a reason. So. Glenn, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I really look forward to sharing this with everybody. And, uh, you. Uh, you know, my, my, my email and my phone is always open to you. So please uh, feel free to thank you, uh, yeah. give, meet anyone uh, along your journey that you think also would uh, be a fitting life's black belt. Please pass them on oh, okay, my way. Great, great, All great. Right. Uh, thank you for the conversation. Uh, most inspiring. I respect what you do and your, your talent in this Q&A conversation. I would hope to meet you, you know, in this life somewhere in the U.S. Perhaps it could happen. Yes, sir. That would, be, that would be great. So. Well, I would love to come out to California for sure. But if you're ever on the East Coast, okay. uh, definitely let me know and give me a heads up. It'd be an honor to meet you, sir. 
Great. Thank you, Eric. All right. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. One more time, thanking our guest uh, and today's Life's Black Belt, Mr. Glenn Kirkpatrick. Thanks again, sir.